by I would start by giving you a, a little bit of background about about and then kind of where I'm where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been affiliated with MIT since 2001, when I joined there as a grad student. And uh, when I joined there, I was in what was called the MIT Wearable Computing Group. And back in 2001, wearable computing uh, really consisted of, of uh, well, of my colleagues uh, strapping computers to their backs and heads-up displays to their to their heads and and walking around Boston and, and campus collecting really interesting data about their environment and about their behavior, much to the amusement of people who, could, who were watching them you know, collect this data. Um, and it didn't help that they, they all referred to themselves as the Borg. Uh, and there is some expectation that I, I would follow suit. Um, but, uh, but luckily, this is, this is you know, 2001, 2002, and this coincides with when Nokia uh, launched their first programmable phone. And so I made a deal with my advisor at the time that uh, if I could program the phone to capture similar types of data as the rest of the Borg, I wouldn't have to spend my graduate career dressing up like a computer. Uh, and, uh, and he, uh, in his infinite wisdom, agreed. And, uh, and I've been hacking on phones ever since, for the last seven years or so. Um, that actually uh, ended up having me move to Africa uh, and it's, that's kind of a long story that I probably won't get into until maybe the end if there's questions. But I've been living in a small village in Kenya for the last three years, um, teaching mobile phone application development, developing my own applications. Um, and probably most relevant to this talk, I've been working with virtually every mobile phone operator in East Africa um, who are sitting on just a gold mine of data. And that's, and that's really kind of what this talk is going to be about. Um, and lastly, yeah, I'm at the, uh, the Santa Fe Institute as well, where I'm, where I'm looking at large-scale network analysis. So, um, so I'll be talking about kind of what I did originally at MIT with 100 people. And, um, and now my attempts to scale that to a new data set that is 1,000 people, and then um, a data that I got last year, which represents close to a million people. And then finally, my largest data set, which uh, is the, uh, the communication habits of, of 250 million people. So, uh, so suddenly, uh, there's a real challenge here, trying to figure out how to, how to scale some of these algorithms. And, and that's kind of what I'll, be, what I'll be addressing for the talk. And ideally, um, it, I'd like to have this a little bit more interactive than, than perhaps what is normal. So if you guys have questions or comments, uh, feel free to just interrupt me. OK. So, so generally, just to make sure that we're all up on the, on the same page here. Um, you know, while, while politically we're living in some pretty exciting times, uh, we're also living in some exciting times because we're witnessing the, uh, the fastest uh, technology uh, adoption in, in human history. Uh, the mobile phone has made uh, more impact on, on the world than, uh, than just about anything, in our, in at least in, in recent memory. Um, there's something, I think experts think that there's on the order of about 4 billion mobile phone subscribers now. Uh, it means that one out of six people on the planet last year bought a new phone. Um, and they bought it not just for kind of the, a two-way communication device, but rather you know, text messaging, for example. Kind of it's, it's a feature that was originally developed for GSM operators to test their networks. Uh, it's now, I think, close to 2 trillion text messages were sent just last year. And even the lowest of the low-end phones, I mean, they have a variety of different input-output connectivity options, and, and most have the, co the uh, computational horsepower of my first desktop PC. Um, but despite kind of these, the connotations that we have that mobile phones are tied to this kind of this, this Western business executive, the, the vast majority of mobile phone subscribers are living in the developing world. Uh, where I was living in this village called Khalifi, I could uh, pay for my taxi cab rides to, the, to the, the market with my mobile phone. I could pay for actually the groceries with my phone. Uh, I would have fishermen come to my house and they would have checked the market prices out while they're at sea. And if they, didn't ha or they weren't happy with the current prices, they would actually show up. And uh, occasionally I would transfer them um, airtime in exchange for the day's catch. People are using phones to do everything from you know, listen to, to traditional Kenyan music, uh, to find out about job opportunities. Um, it's, it's really is phenomenal what, what phones have, have done in, in the developing world, specifically in Africa. I mean, Kenya is now the fastest growing mobile phone market in the world. And, um, and it's just it's an exciting place to do the mobile phone research. Um, but the point is that, uh, that phones today, 
our, our people, the most people on Earth, this is their personal computer. And so the ramifications of that, I'd like, you know, I think it's worth kind of just pausing for a second and thinking about the fact that the majority of our species is now carrying around one of these behavioral sensors that they keep with them, that they keep charged up. Um, and, and, I mean, just thinking about kind of what the ramifications of that are, I think is, is you know, makes, it gives me at least uh, some pause. So, so that's, that's kind of what this talk's going to be about, is that we are entering this, this new era of wearable computing, where we've got, you know, most humans on Earth now wearing a computer. And, um, and that computer is not just a kind of a standalone device, but rather that computer is continuously generating data about their behavior. And, um, and I think there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of interesting things that we can be doing with that data. A lot of scary things that can be done with that data as well, obviously. Um, and we're, and this, this talk is really just going to scratch the surface about, about what I think is going to be a, a, a pretty major new academic discipline coming into the future. So the talk is structured in, in three parts. The first is just I'm going to kind of go through uh, the type of data that I'm talking about, ranging from data collected on handsets, you know, using a little application that just kind of starts on boot and is invisible to the user but just logs everything, but on individual handsets, all the way up to data that's being uh, collected by service providers. Um, and, and probably I'll, I'll, I may try to touch on kind of more internet-enabled data as well, like things like email networks or Facebook and, and so forth, because, um, you know, at the moment we are just, you know, myself in particular, just inundated with behavioral data, um, data that, that social scientists uh, could only dream about 10 years ago. And so it's, uh, so it's a really exciting place to play right now. I'll then, I'll then go to um, talk a little bit about the, the science, uh, what kind of you know, universal laws can we come up with governing anything from human movement to human uh, communication, um, building uh, machine learning algorithms that can do things like predict behavior, that can infer relationships. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm an engineer, and so I always try to keep uh, an eye towards, you know, while you can come up with some universal law that governs human communication, you know, so what? What's, what, are the, what are the end all practical results that, how can this better the lives of, of both the individual as well as perhaps the social system in general? And so I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking about in that area. And, um, and then hopefully solicit some feedback from, from other people like yourselves about, about how this data, how you think this new types, these new types of data could, can actually help society. All right, so uh, behavioral data in the 21st century. Um, I kind of, I mentioned it. I mean, this data collection in the, in, for social research is, is on the brink of just massive change. Um, traditionally, in the social science, it's, it's been all about explicit data, whether it's hu uh, observations of, of human behavior where, or a researcher goes around, like, like this researcher, um, Roethlisberger uh, and Dix, um, Dixon, they went to an electric company back in the, in the 30s, and they just sat there and, and watched people, um, and I think this is a card playing network, so if the people were playing cards with each other, they would, they would get an edge connected to them. And, and you'll still see this graph. This, was, this is data collected in the 30s, yet, it's, it's in today's social network analysis papers. And, and one of the reasons is because we you know, doesn't, don't necessarily have better data than this, or at least we didn't. And, and the point, however, is that you know, the, while, while, this, while the, the research has been pretty focused on things like, um, well, like self-report data, so asking human subjects uh, you know, to, to describe their behavior uh, or observing them, there's this new, new type of data, this implicit data that we're continuously generating um, that, that can really provide a lot of opportunity for social research if we can kind of get, a, get our heads wrapped around it. And the, and the reason why it's hard is that you know, there's, we've, we've gotten really good at analyzing graphs like the one on the right um, that are small. And we've come up with metrics like betweenness centrality, which measures uh, the number of shortest paths any, any node uh, it intercepts. But the, the graph, oh, sorry, the graph on the, on the right, the graph on the left was the, is the, the easy one. The graph on the right um, represents a, a subset of a network that I'm looking at right now that has 250 million nodes, um, 12 billion edges, 5,000 edges a second. 
Uh, you cannot calculate between a centrality on a network like that. So we, we need to come up with a new set of tools uh, that are more appropriate for this type of social networks of the 21st century. And, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm uh, trying, to, uh, trying to encourage other people to do. I mean, it's a, it's a hard problem. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been sitting on this data set for, for about three years. Um, and or originally, you know, so, I, so I, I, got the, I got the data. I moved to this small village in Africa with my laptop. And um, as much as I love my MacBook, like, there is just no way I can analyze a graph of 250 million nodes and 12 billion edges on, on my laptop. Um, I've, I've now uh, built my second supercomputer in the last four months. Um, and, uh, and now we're finally getting some progress about, about doing, you know, whether it's uh, graph traversal or even just kind of degree distributions on networks like this. I mean, I need 10 terabytes. I, I need 64 gigs of RAM. Um, and in fact, and it's not just me. I mean, the social scientists of the 21st century are going to need to learn how to put together a supercomputer because this is the data that, that we're going to be grappling with uh, all, all the more often. But the data doesn't necessarily, um, oops, the data doesn't represent just, uh, let's see if this, oh, it didn't work. Oh, well, so it's, it's not just a static snapshot. Um, Uh-oh, sorry, as much as I love my MacBook, it doesn't seem to be working too well. Let's see. Oh, well. There we go. Um, it's not a static snapshot. So, so while, while I've got this you know, giant graph of, of 250 million nodes, in reality, um, data is being captured continuously. And so, and so when we're talking about static graphs, um, really, like, the new emphasis for me at least is looking at how, how do we deal with continuous data? How do we do look at dynamics? Um, and once you can look at dynamics, how do we deal with things like you know, evolution? Um, so what you're seeing there, um, very briefly, were, were boxes moving around. And, um, and you know, an edge connects people if they're, if they're communicating. This, these are my original subjects from back in 2004. And what, what I did um, originally was just, uh, well, on the individual level, I mean, given the fact that I had data about where S104 was continuously over the course of nine months, and given the fact that they're close to Central Square and it's, say, Tuesday at 5 p.m., um, I built an algorithm that could start predicting where this person's going to have dinner. At what time are they going to have dinner? Who are they going to have dinner with? Uh, going from the individual to the dyadic, given the fact that you know, we know the proximity patterns of S22 and S18. You know, if you're proximate often you know, at, at the MIT coffee house in the afternoons, that corresponds to one type of relationship potentially. But if these guys are proximate in downtown Boston at Saturday at 3 AM consistently, that corresponds to a much different type of relationship. So this isn't rocket science. Um, it's actually quite easy to tease out the underlying dynamics of, of, this, of this system based on, on the data collected from phones. And, then, and lastly, if you just look at, at the aggregate movement um, of, of everyone, you can start seeing trends. Like, you know, the, actually people start speeding up when it turns out to be MIT finals week. People start, you know, actually walk faster, <laughs> literally. Um, you can, you, when the Red Sox, we got the, uh, we were collecting data when the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time. And you saw everyone flock into to downtown Boston. And, um, and actually, the, the city of Boston, we've, been started, we've started working with them because they, they were interested in how people are using the urban infrastructure. You know, when they get into Boston, how do people leave? How many people bike? How many people walk? How many people take the T? Um, this type of data provides answers in, into that. Um, so I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun working with it. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of, while there's a lot of questions that can be potentially addressed, um, generally this is the point uh, where the audience raises, someone is, uh, right, raises their hand and says, like, what about privacy, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the privacy implications of this are, um, are pretty extreme, right? I, uh, I mean, I, I'm following people, following these hundred people around continuously for nine months. Um, but, uh, I mean, I've got to, actually, I've never asked this to an audience before. Um, I mean, the, what the subjects get out of the deal is they get to this really high-end Nokia handset that they get to use for the duration, for, any, for as long as they're in the study. Um, how many people here would participate in the study? Just a show of hands. All right. So that's like, maybe about half. That's, that's good. That's surprising, actually. Uh, how, how, many people, how many people here have phones? 
Most, no, just about everyone. All right, so, so the half of you that wouldn't participate in the study because of, you know, for whatever reason, um, the thing to really remember is that um, if, you're, if you're carrying around a phone, uh, we can place you on this map. We can infer, you know, what you're going to be doing for dinner. We know who your friends are. Um, <laughs> we, 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 I'm speaking kind of like the, the big we. I don't know anything about you personally. But, but it, it really is important, like, because people aren't necessarily cogniz cognizant of the fact that, that um, you're, you are, you're carrying around a tracking device. And this tracking device is creating unprecedented data, not just about you, not just about your family, but, but about this nation, about this world. Um, and, uh, and while that's, that, that is scary, that opens the door for some, some just phenomenal social research that, that, um, that has yet to happen, but I think will happen soon. So um, just to kind of back up, and I'm going to go quite quickly through this. How, how are we capturing data originally? Um, we, basically, what we did is, um, with help of uh, the Helsinki Institute of, of Technology, some fantastic mobile phone hackers there, uh, we created Uber spyware for mobile phones. Uh, a, something, a little application that's when it's installed on a phone, it starts on boot, it's invisible to the user, and it literally logs everything. So just writing data to the memory card about the cell tower IDs that are, uh, that are defined. And, and actually, it starts learning about the, the, the user and um, will vibrate. If, if, if the user goes into an area that it doesn't know, the phone will vibrate and say, hey, can you label this location? And so we're getting labels like you know, Jenny's apartment or the B-side lounge or my office. And so, so the phone is basically building up this labeled data set about locations. Uh, through cell towers. Um, it's also doing continuous Bluetooth scans. So every five minutes, we, it does a scan for visible Bluetooth devices. Now, Bluetooth, um, well, it's an RF protocol. It was originally developed for wire replacement. Um, but what's great about Bluetooth is that every Bluetooth device has a unique identifier, uh, an identifier that basically is unique to your laptop or your phone or your camcorder. They're putting Bluetooth in everything now, um, but unique to that device and that device alone. And so it's a signature. And so, so you know, we are, we are getting the proximity not just of other subjects when they're walking around Boston, but proximity of just about everybody, uh, anyone with a visible Bluetooth device at least. So, um, so that, that has become a really fun type of data and actually has spawned several um, companies uh, that are interested in kind of the commercial applications of, of Bluetooth tracking. Uh, and I can talk about that as well, but it's probably not, not part of this original talk. Obviously, we're logging communication, um, so both phone calls and text messaging. And we're coupling all this data with kind of standard, standard surveys. And so I don't want to give the impression that, I, you know, when I talk about this, this, this change in data collection for the social sciences, this isn't going to replace traditionally, you know, explicit data. Surveys are always going to have a major role, as are just kind of human observation. Um, but, but what I'm hoping to make is the point that, that this provide this type of new data provides a great complement for the tr more traditional ways of collecting social social uh, data. So it represents 400,000 hours of, of continuous human behavior uh, collected in 2004, 2005, and I've been you know I, I've been trumpeting that number for a while um, until we started doing more studies. And so um, you know a few years ago, well actually it's been it's now ongoing in Kenya. So we've got 50 subjects in Kenya, and these are subjects who are who are not necessarily MIT uh, students, but rather uh, from virtually all, every walk of life, from taxi cab drivers to um, uh, people who actually have never used a phone before. Because um, that was one of the major critiques of the original study was that, well, so you can build these models and do well at, at figuring out what, what MIT students are doing, but so what? How does that scale to the rest of society? And so, so we're getting a lot more data. Uh, so we have close to a million hours now of data that, that has been captured um, using, using this system. But then uh, Nokia recently gave me, they're doing kind of a similar study now with their, their own uh, employees. And so, so now, so that's, that involves about 2,000 people. And, uh, and so then we have like, that, that presents about 50 million hours of data. And then, um, well, I can kind of keep the story going. But uh, right now, sitting in our, my two supercomputers, I've got on the order of like tens, uh, hundreds actually, hundreds of billions of hours of data. Um, of, of behavioral data. 
And so, so you're talking about millions of humans' life, lifespans. Um, so it's exciting. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of data, though. Uh, and um, this, is, this is another different data set. Basically, this represents um, the, the data that is, involves 250 million nodes represents every phone call, virtually every phone call, over 90%, um, landline and fixed line phone calls made in the UK during the month of August of 2005. So, um, so, a lot, I mean, so it's many more phone numbers than are actually people living in the country, but I mean, you get a lot of people who have two numbers, a lot of international calls, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and th so we've got other things besides the, uh, the, the phone calls, though, that I found quite interesting are things like product adoption. So what telecommunication products are people purchasing? Uh, and how does that type of, um, that type of uh, contagion diffuse over the network? Um, so there's a lot of objectives there. And then and, uh, over the summer, I've got, uh, working with MTN in Rwanda, um, every phone call, like, that has been made in that country uh, for the last three and a half years, coupled with the locations, coupled with product adoption, coupled with things like top-up plans and airtime sharing. Um, so it's, a, uh, uh, it's actually a, 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 even a larger data. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to address a whole bunch of questions. And then I'm, I've got CDR now from, uh, from similar data from Kenya. And, uh, and two weeks ago, I received the same data from the Dominican Republic. Let's see if I can show a little. So this is August 8th, 2005. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I'm not very good at visualizations, but Google Earth turns out to make, make things pretty easy. Um, but this is just, uh, I'm, I'm plotting the international calls uh, for, the, for this particular day. And, and one of the just, just interesting things I found is that the old colonial administrator, this, the red lines are, are uh, calls that are outgo or sorry, incoming into Rwanda, green or outgoing. You've got lots of people making calls to India, a lot of calls, people making, receiving calls from, uh, from Belgium, which, is, which was surprising. Um, so that's, that's the data. Um, are, there any, are there any questions, or can I just move on to, to the analysis? Yeah, please. Um, uncompressed uh, on the order of, well, it depends on which one you're talking about. Both the, uh, the, um, the, the UK data uncompressed uh, is on the order of about five terabytes. Um, so it's, it's manageable. So you, so you work with the governments of uh, Kenya? And no, this, is, this has nothing to do with the governments. This has everything to do with the mobile service providers. Uh, well, you know, Africa, it, it, Kenya at the forefront is the fastest growing mobile phone market in the world. And Wild Wild West is exactly the right way to, to call this. I mean, the mobile phone, op the, the service providers, um, you know, after you get water to people, uh, the, the people want mobile phone service. Um, and, so, uh, and so you get these cowboys coming in to, to a variety of different places um, who are setting up base stations and making sure the base stations uh, are, are operational. Um, so it's a, and it, there's there's a lot of money to be made. But I think to be followed up, I think that the social network follows the phones sometimes. When the phones come in there, they're probably the network form where there are no networks prior. When you say networks, what do you do? network? What type of network are we? Uh, I'll, I'll All right, please. For the sensible data, since like. That's absolutely true. We have um, only cell tower information. Cell tower is normally, especially in the MIT area, maybe like uh, one or two miles. Well, I, so what happens is you, you're generally attached to the, fo the, the tower that you're most proximate to, but that's not always the case. Um, so in terms of in urban areas, we get resolutions down to on the order of maybe four blocks. Uh, in rural areas, you're absolutely right. It's on the order of a few miles. But um, for a lot of the data that uh, that I've been interested in looking at just kind of larger scale mobi mobility patterns. Um, at least I know, you know, someone living in, 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 a, in a farm in rural Rwanda and, you know, what, when do they move into Kigali, right? So I, so I know the kind of the more broad scale, but I can't actually pinpoint where their house is. So we're, that we're using Bluetooth to do that. So, so we put Bluetooth beacons, probably about a good 150 of them, all over campus. 
And so these Bluetooth beacons have a range of about 10 meters. So when the, when the, when the subject walks by, and that's how we're getting things like uh, walking speed. We put them all up and down the infinite corridor. We have this giant corridor at MIT. Um, and, uh, and you can actually start seeing when you detect a particular phone. Um, when the, so the beacon is continuously scanning. These are static beacons. Yeah, but the only node in each of them, the only node that is detectable. The beacons we know, we know exactly where we put them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so how many of the beacons you put there? Uh, on the, a little bit over 100, not uh, less than 200, but around 125, 150. Okay. So what's a typical data point for you? Is it time, location, and phone number? Is so it depends on what data we're talking about. Um, for CDR, it's, uh, it's, it's caller, the caller, the receiver, uh, the time the call started, the duration, the tower that the, uh, the, the caller or the receiver was associated with when the call started and the tower when it ended. Um, okay, let's do, well, let's do one more question and I'll move on to science. I'm just curious about the landscape of cell towers in East Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. As 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 you know, more and more phones or more and more subscribers sign up. You need this. The the service providers have to um, basically make sure that they can have an, uh, like enough bandwidth to support the calls that that these providers these uh, these subscribers make. And so yeah, you're seeing towers pop up everywhere. I mean, uh, and 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 the power for these towers in these rural areas is just. Is fascinating. Mounting wind turbines to the towers, putting up pan solar panels. Um, ha, you know, th that's in a whole other talk, actually, how you can start powering these things. But let me let me move on to uh, to the next part of the talk. I think uh, at least now people have an idea of, of the type of data that that I'll be talking about. In terms of some of the insights, um, the the first one of the the reasons why I initially embarked on this was that reading the social science literature uh, about things like survey data. Um, I was immediately struck by the fact that there are no error bars, right? So when you talk about social, uh, social data and, you know, social research data um, and, and you, you give out people, you give surveys to people and you get back the surveys and you do your analysis, um, as far as I can tell, most social scientists assume that they've found this data gathering mechanism that has no error. That you know the, sur the survey response is ground truth, and it is exactly what happened, and and the analysis is 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 done with that mentality, um, and uh, and I don't, can't think of any other science that makes that type of assumption, um, you know. So so what I wanted to do originally was just kind of start validating surveys in general. Please. Okay, I'm sorry. You're right. That, I, that was a, a very broad generalization. When I started this, when I started this research, I was I read a couple papers that pushed me towards that general that that mentality. That's that's not I, that was. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a huge generalization. It's not necessarily true across all social science. Okay. Well, and and because of the fact that you know, for survey data, asking someone whether you're a friend or not. Um, I mean, it's this, it's, it's a binary thing, right? And so it's hard to figure out, you know, are you really a friend? Like, are, were you just, were you just labeling that or, you know, and you could do follow-up studies, but then perhaps the relationship has changed. So, so it's re it really is hard to figure out what's error and what's not error. Um, and that's, and that's the point. Um, and so one way to grapple with figuring out what's error and what's not error is to actually get a sensor onto people and ask people about, about behavior. And, uh, and then see whether the sensor data coincides with, um, with the actual self-report. And so that's the, the, that's the very first thing we did was just try to see, um, you know, we asked people, hey, how often are you proximate with, you know, each of the other subjects in the study? Uh, and what it turns out is that um, the, the people who are friends tend to do quite well at estimating their proximity. The people who aren't necessarily friends, you know, almost have an uncorrelated response rate from for proximity to uh, uh, the, actual, the proximity that the sensor detected and the proximity that they reported. Um, but beyond just kind of the relationships that people have, uh, you get other effects like recency. So we were, we were looking at, we asked people, you know, what's the proximity patterns that you had over the course of the last three months? And what it turns out is the response is extremely, it's correlated with what we've done in the last week, but then, then it tails off. Um, and so, Again, it's just kind of looking a little bit more in detail about, about what people are actually reporting. When they're asked, when they're asked to report behavior over, over a, a long uh, longitudinal period, 
uh, I think you see a real bias towards reporting what you did in the last week. But again, this needs, I mean, this is, this is still kind of pretty preliminary. Um, so that was, that was the first thing that I, I wanted to look at. Um, but then, you know, for my PhD thesis, I ended up just building a bunch of, uh, a bunch of mathematical models. Um, and we've got a, a variety of different ways that we've analyzed this data, ranging from um, taking a, a cell tower network, uh, basically detecting kind of communities of salient locations, putting those in, those in as observations in a condition hidden Markov model. And the output is essentially these, these states. Uh, you know, and for the, very mo the, sim the simplest model, just things like, are you at home, are you at work, um, are you somewhere else, do you, or do you not have a signal? Um, but once you have a series of states, and whatever those states are, basically just behavioral states uh, of a given subject, what you can do is um, start extracting you know, patterns. And again, this isn't, this isn't necessarily hard. There's this idea of information entropy, which uh, it corresponds to the, the structure that you have in a, in a particular set of data. Um, and you can see this is a low entropy subject, meaning there's a lot of structure. This person's life, um, this is their location. Um, white corresponds to being at home. Um, this colored part generally corresponds to being at work and then, and then being at home again. You see these white stripes corresponding to weekends. This is the month, I think, of January. Um, the point here is that there's, there's a lot of structure, and you can just eyeball it. Um, and so when you calculate this person's entropy, it's, it's low, whereas this person, um, you know, this is a grad student who, uh, who potentially, like, you know, he's just as likely to be in his office at, at 3 in the morning as, as it looks like 2 p.m. So, so there's a lot less structure. And so the idea of calculating the entropy associated with people's behavior gives us a little bit of an idea of uh, how likely our, our behavioral algorithms are going to do at predicting what this person is going to do next. So, so, that's, um, so that's the idea of, 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 of entropy. And actually, I've got now... Um, I'm working with a company that's trying to, um, well, trying to basically be Nielsen. And so they're randomly sampling. Um, uh, they're giving out phones to you know, thousands of random, as opposed to MIT students or MIT faculty, um, rand just random people from LA and Chicago and San Francisco. And, uh, and the striking thing is, is that, um, well, actually, I can show it in the next slide. Um, this is the original results where we're seeing, like, you know, MIT, the media lab, or the freshmen are the most entropic, meaning they're the most random demographic. Whereas, and then it goes, you know, incoming grad students, senior grad students, business school students, the faculty, and then finally the admin staff as the, as the least entropic, meaning the, their lives have the most structure. Um, we were just talking about this morning, there's, there's one person from the faculty at MIT that we had to throw out, a guy named Marvin Minsky, who's, um, uh, who's uh, well, who's the office next to mine and was very eager to participate, but his life was so entropic that, um, that none, of our, none of our stuff worked on him at all, and so we, we threw him out of the data. Um, and originally, I thought that was an okay thing to do, but we've now with this Nielsen uh, company, IMMI is what they're called, uh, we're finding that there are these, these particular individuals across the board in society, you know, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status, that um, are more or less random. And, uh, and I have no idea how to account for that, but I, I feel like throwing them out of the study isn't necessarily the right thing to do anymore. Um, uh, the last, I, I put this, you know, which demographic is the most infectious? Uh, this, I, I, uh, one of the things that at the Santa Fe Institute we're, we're toying around with is the idea of what would happen if we gave a particular demographic, a member of a diff demographic, SARS, the beginning of the school year. How would that spread? I mean, because we've got all the proximity patterns. I mean, generally, these epidemiological models are these kind of deterministic things that, um, you know, assume more or less fully connected networks. Whereas here, we, I mean, SARS itself, I mean, it spreads on, on, a, uh, on a proximity network. If you're proximate to someone, then there's a probability that you could infect them. And uh, to date, there aren't that many. In fact, I think this might be the only proximity network of a large scale that there is. And so we can actually now, you know, you know does SARS spread faster if we infect a freshman or a professor? Um, those are the types of questions that I think might be interesting to answer that I don't have answers to. Um, I think I'm going to have to speed up. Um, so there's, well, one, one of the ways to, um, once you've kind of quantified the structure, how do you take advantage of the structure that you find in people's lives? And uh, an easy way to do that is, is with kind of dimensionality reduction, PCA, eigen decomposition. Um, and so 
like the main takeaway from our eigen behaviors work is that you can think of every day of your life as a single point in, in a very high dimensional space. And, th and the point really is that the, these, these, these single days are not randomly distributed through this high dimensional space, but rather they're clustered. Um, and you can, you can compress the space down to just a few key dimensions, uh, which represent basically the eigenvectors of, of, this, of this space. And once you can do that, then you can kind of get a better sense for, um, well, both you know, for prediction. So you can kind of, given the fact that you know a certain amount of where that person's eigenspace is, you can predict what they're gonna do next. But you can also you do it for things like affinity. Uh, and affiliation. So, so we can actually, we were able to uh, create this kind of business school behavior space. So the business school students were all kind of interacting on this, on this, in this single space. And you can measure the distance between an individual. Now an individual is a, 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 a point rather than a day. Uh, the, diff the, uh, the Euclidean distance between that, that individual and the business school space to infer whether that person's a business school student or not. And, uh, and that gives over 90% accuracy. Um, so, so that's the individual stuff. Now kind of moving to dyadic relationships, or so based pairs of people. Um, the network on the left is the self-report friendship network. Uh, the network on the right is the one-day proximity network. So, so what you're seeing is that there's still structure. These are business school students. These are kind of media lab students. Um, you can see that you know, the business school students are all interacting. They're all proximate in this particular day. And, and the same goes for the, the, uh, the MIT, the media lab students. But the, the trick is how can you start winnowing down this network to represent the actual friendship graph? How can you infer where the relationships really lie? Um, but luckily, we've got a lot more information than just kind of are you proximate in a given 24-hour period. A collaborator of mine calls this kind of the relationship EKG, <laughs> which, I, which I don't like, but it seems to be sticky. Um, uh, so the blue line corresponds to non okay, so there's three different types of relationships. There's the reciprocal friends. So this is, again, going back to self-report, right? I say I'm friends with Mike. Mike says he's friends with me. That's a reciprocal friendship. There's also the type of friendship where I say I'm friends with Mike, but Mike doesn't say he's friends with me, all right? And then there's the last relationship where neither Mike or I say that we're friends. So, so green corresponds to reciprocal, blue is non-reciprocal, and red is uh, reciprocal non-friends. And the striking thing is that you see the prob this is the probability of proximate proximity at work at MIT. And the, and the people that are non-reciprocal friends, the ones that, you know, I think Mike's my friend because we hang out an awful lot on campus. Um, but, but, but potentially, this is, this is actually proximity off campus. Uh, and you see that, the, uh, that the, basically if you don't necessarily hang out with someone off campus, then there's this, this potential stigma where you fall into this category of a reciprocal non-friend. But there's lots of these other types of dyadic variables you can use. Proximity on Saturday nights, communication, uh, proximity outside work, proximity at home. We can infer where people's homes are. And, so, and actually that's a great indicator. If you're going to someone's house, you're very likely to label that person a friend. Um, so with all these dyadic variables, and you can create all these different networks uh, from those variables. And you can think of the networks, you know, the e nodes are, are people here. Edge represents, you know, in this case, edge represents proximity on Saturday night. So this is the proximity on Saturday night graph, the communication graph, the friendship graph, the number of unique locations, so are you traveling with that person graph. So you've got this, uh, a, a network with multidimensional edges associated with it. And you can use those different edges and those different edge weights to infer whether or not there's an actual relationship. And, and I'm making the call here that like the self-report uh, friendship network actually is the ground truth, for, for this model at least. And so we found that, um, well for one thing, we've actually, we can show quite easily that, that, um, that there are three different types of relationships. Like the dyads that are non-reciprocal friends are a fundamental distribution. Uh, like they, are, they represent a particular type of relationship that is, is very different from the other two, which are the reciprocal friends and reciprocal non-friends. And we can, we can do pretty well at inferring who are the reciprocal friends and reciprocal non-friends. So we can get 95% accuracy in terms of inferring who's friends with who on the graph. So we can infer 95% of the edges, which is, uh, which is reasonably good. Uh, and so we've got uh, a paper on, on this inferring the structure of the topology of friendship networks based on proximity data coming out hopefully soon. But um, again, this is, the, uh, this is the friendship graph here, and this is our inferred, our inferred network. 
And what's nice about the, the, the mobile phone data, again, is as opposed to the self-report data, which is it's clearly important so we can get at least a sense of what's going on, but the, with the proximity data, we can actually get weights. We, it's like friendship is, is not a binary thing, obviously, right? It's, this, it's a continuum. And, um, and you know, if someone's really is proximate a lot at home, proximate a lot on Saturday nights, we can start building up a, a much higher probability that they're friends, which corresponds to kind of a weighted edge on our inferred, on our inferred social network. So this is now uh, going from dyads to uh, a group. So this is my research group. Um, this is our proximity patterns over a given week now in, in July. Um, and so you'll see, you know, so we're proximate during the, uh, during the week. That's Friday. Turns to Saturday and we're not, we're not proximate at all. But um, one of the things that you can kind of get, if you can start capturing the underlying dynamics um, of a research group, you can hopefully get some insight into kind of what's, what actually is driving um, the behavior of, of, of these types of people. Um, and one of the things that uh, we've been working on recently is just figuring out what's the right sampling rate. Well, what you saw there was a series of snapshots uh, taken every hour. But that sampling rate is pretty arbitrary. Like, you know, if you're getting continuous behavioral data, um, what should the sampling rate be? When you want to do network analysis, if you're doing a sampling rate of, of 30 seconds, then you wouldn't necessarily see a lot of edges in this network. If you're doing a sampling rate of a month, it would be a fully connected graph. So, so how do you, so where do you, um, you know, basically how do you sample? And so we started sampling it at different rates and we started showing how different network metrics um, can essentially get washed out. So um, it's one of these things that I think as, as researchers do more and more of this type of data analysis, you need to be aware of, of like, you know, what, what, are the, what is the underlying frequency that you need to sample at so that you don't, so you can, you can actually capture the real signal without sampling too much and, and then kind of having that signal watch out because you'd have too few edges. So it's a challenge and again, it's not a, it's not a, a solved problem by any means. And then finally, so that was you know, a group of six people. This is, the, this is all of the subjects in terms of just the amount of proximity, the proximity events that happen over the course of I think three months. And you can start seeing things like there was a, um, a sponsor week here at MIT where all of the sponsors from the Media Lab came and there's this just organizational cohesion where people spent the night at the lab. Um, and you could just see lots, lots of proximity even, even in the evenings. And then, uh, and then this is finals week, so again, kind of cohesion. And then it goes, drops down for, um, for Christmas. Um, but one of the, the striking things is that this is just a time series and you can take a Fourier transform of it. And, um, and when you do, you did, there's not, nothing really that surprising. Um, you get a major peak at 24 hours, which, which makes sense, right? Like that's kind of one of the operational things. Um, and then, you know, given the fact that this is like lots and lots of network snapshots consisting of, of hundreds of thousands of hours, um, you, can, you can finally get to this result that, you know, the second highest peak is at 168 hours, which makes sense. It's, it's seven days, right? So, so given all this data and, you know, years of analysis, I've been able to empirically show that a week has seven days, which, is, <laughs> which people make fun of me about. Um, Working with um, uh, Marta Gonzalez, uh, she, she recently was uh, at center stage at some major controversy about this type of analysis over the summer. In fact, the New York Times called this research illegal in, in America. But uh, she was able to, she managed to get the cover of Nature, which, which is, is pretty good too. Um, but what we're, what we're looking at are mobility patterns. So, so basically trying to figure out um, what she uh, and, and her colleagues originally did were looking at a particular country, looking at how, how people move in that country. Um, and, uh, and while the word, the, the word of like universal human movement laws have been thrown around, it's not quite true yet. Um, but I, I hope that we're getting there. I mean, now uh, I'm bringing to the table a bunch of other data, data from Kenya, data from the UK, data from the Dominican Republic. Um, and, uh, and I think like, the, the, the goal is to try to figure out, you know, what are the universal attributes of, of this type of movement? And, um, and you know, you know how, how much is culturally dependent? How much is dependent on the continent, dependent on your social economic status, that sort of thing? Please. Sorry, yeah, of course. Uh, this is the probability of moving in a particular, a particular distance, and this is the distance that, that you're going to be moving. So, um, so that's, that's essentially the graph. And this is all Marta's. But I'm, just, I'm just starting this. Um, one of the th so beyond, so, so the, the work with Marta's movement, the work that, um, 
the other, the other aspect of this kind of universal laws um, for human behavior is the universal laws of human communication. Um, and where I'm at at the moment, they, they love these types of plots. And so I have to have a plot like this in, in most of my talks. Um, and it, but it is, <laughs> while, while people can snicker about power laws, um, and there's certainly a lot to snicker about, um, it is kind of, when you step back and think about it, um, it is pretty amazing. Um, like this, is, this is represents the calls from you know, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and, and what you're seeing here is like, Basically, there's uh, in this particular day, this is August 19th, 2005, there, there are 10 million people who made one call. And then like a million people made 10 calls. 100,000 people made 100 calls. And it just goes back. So, so you're getting this, this uniform structure that's kind of governing the, the behavior of these idiosyncratic, hundreds of millions of idiosyncratic particles that are, that are just kind of randomly, we would think, calling each other. And you get this, this great structure coming out of it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, while people are pulling out these types of power laws everywhere, I still think that there, there is something interesting here. But ha perhaps what is more interesting is looking at the slope of the line. Um, what, what is striking is that, you know, not only is the fact that it's, it's an amazing power law for many, many um, of these decades, but uh, <laughs> the slope of the line is, well, this is, this is the slope of the, of the uh, well, this is the exponent, essentially, of that power law for incoming calls and outgoing calls. For one thing, it's, it's kind of inversely symmetric, which I don't necessarily understand. But the more surprising thing is that, you know, this is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You get this kind of, this structure that's repeated across every day of the week, um, again, for these, these hundreds of millions of people. Um, and I, I have no explanation. But, uh, but it's, it's fun kind of pulling out these things. And, and it's fun to start building theories that, um, that, that can conform to uh, this type of, uh, type of crazy behavior. Are you discriminating between individual use and institutions? No. And that's why you're seeing some people making, when I say people, I mean phone numbers, <laughs> unique phone numbers, making you know, hundreds of thousands of calls. And that's you know, probably telling us to vote for McCain, right? Like these, are, these aren't individuals. Um, I'm starting a collaboration with some guys in urban studies. I need to, I need to go faster. I'm uh, basically looking at urban versus rural networks. Um, one of the things that you find is that as, as you increase the number of contacts, you really can't increase the amount of you, time you spend not talking on the phone. I mean, unless, unless you are a business, um, you, so you, you get this kind of tail off both in urban areas and in rural areas at about the same amount of call volume. But with the striking thing, and this is this is very much preliminary, and I've, it needs to be um, uh, it needs to be really kind of done rigorously. But uh, like consistently, I'm seeing in, in urban areas, people have lower degree, lower contacts than than in rural areas, and that kind of goes uh, counter to at least what I've read in some of the literature. Um, and I and I and, and I think it may have to do with socioeconomic status. So uh, in, in in the UK in particular, they're they're. Um, there, are these, uh, there are these, basically, the rural areas, uh, or at least a lot of the rural areas, have higher uh, socioeconomic status. People make more money than living in, in, in parts of London. Um, but, but again, this is all conjecture. I don't, I don't know what's happening there. Um, kind of talking to that point, though, is that uh, this, I've been working with the civil service in the UK to get a bunch of kind of census data about um, kind of, well, what they call uh, regional deprivation. And they, have this, they use this index of deprivation that corresponds to income levels, average education, um, access to health care, that sort of thing. And it kind of all converges on a single number. And the striking thing is that there's not a, necessarily, at least, a relationship with uh, communication, the amount of communication people make and, and their socioeconomic status. Where the strong correlation, the correlation of R squared of greater than 0.7, is that um, it's, it's the diversity. So, so you get these insular communities that just call each other. And they may make tons of phone calls, but it's only to a small group of people. And those are the ones that are poorest off socioeconomically, where it's, it's the regions and individuals that are making a wide range of calls to a lot of groups of people. Um, that's, that's really where you're, those are the regions um, that are really thriving. Um, and, uh, and again, I need to be kind of have more of a background in, in this type of uh, urban analysis to, to give you a good theory on why. But, um, again, this is the type of example data that's just kind of falling out um, from, from these terabytes of, of call logs. 
What time do we need to stop? All right. Um, so should I wrap up in 10 or yeah, less? Maybe another five or 10 minutes. Okay. All right. So, so very briefly, um, application. So beyond the fact that we're, we're kind of learning about our society as a whole, um, how, can this, how can this help people? Uh, and one of the things that we've been, uh, I've, been, I've been playing with is just this idea of, um, well, if you can start inferring people's context, you can create kind of this automatic diary. So if you can figure out, you know, if you're sleeping or whether you're having lunch or you're out on the town, then um, what that gives you is this kind of ability to query your life. And so this is, I've been, I've been pitching Google this for a while now, um, but like this, this to me is the future of personalized search. Like I can, I can query my system and say, hey, when was the last time I saw Marvin? Uh, how much time did I spend driving last week? Um, when did, I, when did I last eat lunch with Josh? Where did I go next after I did something? Um, so you're, you're continually getting all this personal data about yourself, and, uh, and if you can start querying it, that potentially, uh, well, potentially leads to prediction as well. What are the probability that, you know, Caroline's going to call me this weekend, or will I be working uh, late? And you can almost think about this as kind of an automatic scheduler um, that can infer what you're going to do next. And we've got some fun visualizations of this type of data as well. Um, I initially created something that would start connecting people together. Um, people, people who didn't know each other but probably should know each other for whatever reasons, for mainly for conferences. So, um, so you have this profile and we've got all this information about ourselves, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, uh, about who we are and what we like to do, potentially even who we want to meet. Um, but it's all stored in kind of the most anti-social place. You got to get access it when you're in your office in front of your computer. Right? So if we could suddenly untether all that social information we have about ourselves and our friends uh, and put them into, into social such situations, that would add value. Um, at least that was the hypothesis. And so um, this is, that's uh, Nicholas Negroponte uh, getting introduced using this system to some guy from Microsoft that he doesn't want to be introduced to, it turns out. But um, <laughs> the, idea, the idea is, I think, still pretty good. Um, so you get these Bluetooth scans and then you eventually you get like a little um, a picture that uh, is saying like and basically some kind of icebreaker saying, hey, you should meet this person. I mean, you have, your phone has meeting mode and outdoor mode and silent mode. I mean, this is kind of like socially promiscuous mode for your mobile phone. Um, and, uh, and while I thought it'd be great for conferences, it immediately got um, repurposed for the dating scene in Manhattan. And so, so, that's, so it's now to connect singles. Um, so this, let's see if I can get this playing. Um, this represents a whole bunch of GPS data. Um, and actually what we're doing is inferring uh, nights, like basically night life spots uh, around San Francisco. So, um, so, and what's also interesting is you can see the different types of people going to the different nightclubs. Um, and, uh, and when you do a little eigen rotation of it, you can do some clustering and figure out where these, where these nightclubs are and, and basically, um, and you know, get a fun visualization of that. The reason why, um, these guys at Sense Networks are doing this is because they were originally going to uh, sell this data to hedge funds. Um, because what they're able to do is say, like, we can tell you, you know, whether Macy's are going to meet their numbers this quarter or not based on the number of people that we're seeing going into their store. Uh, I don't think that's as interesting of a, an application, but I think uh, <laughs> what you could do instead is, you know, given the fact that, you know, people kind of randomly distributed, random distributed dots are suddenly symptomatic for some disease. You can actually now play this backwards. Can you start seeing whether if all these randomly distributed people were at the same spot at the same time? Um, what you can then do is then isolate a potential bioterror attack. And this is not my idea. This is an idea for a guy named Ron uh, Hoffield, uh, who was working at MIT Lincoln Labs. And uh, it was this, this, this concept was to be able to not only, not only detect a, a, an outbreak of some, some virus, you know, um, that potentially only manifests itself in symptoms five or, you know, ten days after. But also you can start identifying other people who were exposed before they even become symptomatic, which is a, which is a major concern for, for a lot of groups. Um, and so that was called Trackback. And he's, uh, he's still trying to pitch. It got, it got some original funding, but then the, um, the government got scared from the PR, and so they, uh, they pulled all the funding for it. But I think it's a, it's a fundamentally a, a, a fantastic idea um, and, uh, and can easily be done with, with this, this type of data that's, that Sense is collecting. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Let's see. I think I'll try to wrap it up. The last thing that we're, uh, we're looking at, this is kind of 
Again, fun things that easily fall out of this type of data. It turns out for product adoption, if you do adopt a particular product, say A, so, so there's A, B, and C, or three people. Uh, a and B adopt a particular product. Um, and then there's this probability that we're trying to assign that whether C, or C adopts the product or not. And it turns out that if A and B are friends, C has a much greater chance of adopting the product than, than if A and B aren't, don't necessarily call each other. Um, uh, so there's this kind of idea that you have more mutual influence if you're, if you're, if you're connected, um, which, is, which is potentially interesting to some people. Um, and, then, and then I'm working with, uh, I mentioned briefly, a uh, uh, developmental economist at Oxford on diffusion across these types of graphs where contagion can be anything from a product to uh, churn to whatever else. And there's a lot of other researchers working on, on this type of idea, but um, I don't think it, it hasn't obviously been nailed yet. And there's a lot that you can do um, for things like quantifying influence. So if, if I adopt a particular product, that changes the probability that my, my peers are going to adopt that product. And that delta probability corresponds to my influence over my peers. And if you can start quantifying that, that influence across a network of hundreds of millions of people, um, that's, again, potentially interesting. So I, I, am, I am inundated with data. Uh, I've got a lot, of, a lot of projects ranging from you know, anticipating, anticipatory computing, which kind of predicts what I'm going to be doing next and, and potentially helps me do that. Uh, inferring relationships, I need dramatic help with visualizations, obviously. Um, but but that's the nice thing to, about this research is that you know I've been able to collaborate with everyone from uh, social psychologists to physicists um, and virtually everyone in between. Um, and so this uh, the rea reality mining data set has been downloaded tens of thousands of times, has generated hundreds of journal publications, um, and has been a really fun thing for me to be a part of. Um, but it really is just the beginning. I mean, with this new data sets, um, it's, uh, I, I've, I've got way more work than I can possibly do, so I'm, I'm looking for help. Um, and uh, you know, there's some other stuff, whether it's related to diffusion or disease, uh, identifying scaling laws, uh, figuring out how people use urban infrastructure. Um, there's, uh, I mean, this is just a small subset of all the things I need help with. So, um, so that's, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you for having me. I mean, so I've got my students actually call and let it ring. One time means yes, two times means no, three times pick me up at the market, right? So it's like, and <laughs> you're dealing with a reward mechanism that is probably tied into the same addiction reward mechanism that for instance, cocaine as in craving, we think we understand it a little bit. You didn't mention any of that, but you thought about how this I mean, uh, heroin. Uh, so we're, we're potentially starting a collaboration with some guys who, I had no idea this was actual research, that they're, they're, they inject people with heroin. Um, people who, drug, drug users who are not seeking help, they're interested in, in those types of effects. Uh, and, uh, and we're potentially giving these heroin users phones and, and looking at their behavior. Um, and looking whether we can start detecting, um, is, does someone, is someone experiencing cravings? Uh, what, what are the behavioral signatures associated with going down into a bench? Can you, can you find those before they actually start doing the bench? Um, addicted to cell phones, I haven't thought about, um, <coughs> uh, but, um, but I will. Can you comment on probabilistic graphical models, the ones that you think are the most useful, ones that are sure. especially the dynamic models? Yeah, you have so, a lot of dynamic data. So these dynamic Bayesian networks are things that I've, I've been spending a lot of time on recently. Um, and. Uh, the, the ones that have worked the best, like it's really, fun, it's really, you know, satisfying to kind of create your own DBN and uh, and name it after something you find funny or whatever. 
But um, the, the ones that I think work the best are the most simple. And so that, condi that, that con one that's conditioned temporally, that's just looking at simple cell tower observations, that works just as well as the ones that take you know, you know, weeks to actually train up and run. Um, the, we have a paper um, coming out in MIPS uh, on, on looking at these X-factor models. So basically kind of a simple DBN that's conditionally, uh, uh, the, you know, temporally conditioned on, well, sorry, conditioned on time, um, as well as you get these, these observations. Uh, but the hidden state is also affected by this uh, X factor, which is kind of corresponds to all these uh, basically uh, unforeseen events. And, and, and when the X factor a variable is, is switched on, you start seeing things that uh, your model would never have predicted. Um, and we found that's kind of useful for, well, it's been useful for things like um, EKG monitoring in hospitals, but it's also useful to try to figure out you know, whether someone goes, is going down to a heroin binge. They do something quite unpredictable. So, so yeah, I've been playing with a lot, but I've been, my takeaway is that the simpler the better. You would have to deal with institutional review boards. Oh yeah, so, so to, to, to launch uh, reality mining, it took almost a year of dealing with CUIs, the Committee on Using Human Subjects. Uh, you, you should, like, the, the uh, consent form is, is, is huge. I had to sit with every subject and gonna go through the whole thing, uh, making sure everyone is very cognizant of the fact that um, they knew what kind of data was being captured, they knew how to turn the data off, and they were, they were aware of the fact that they could delete any part of the data or all the data at any given time. Um, so those, those were the requirements to do this in a university setting. Uh, the requirements that you know, this company, IMMI, is you know, doing it for these 15,000 people, much less stringent. <laughs> I mean, so, so if you're relying just on, on location in these states, then you're screwed. Um, but if you've got additional observational variable, Bluetooth, for example, you know when someone's in their office having lunch with them. You can infer lunch because of temporally, because you know, you know the time of day, you know who they're hanging out with. Um, the gold mine would be to start uh, also, you know, coupling this with their activities on the computer. Uh, you know, are they emailing, are they doing something else? Um, and, what we're also doing with IMMI is that the other sensor that I haven't talked about at all is the microphone. Um, so what they're doing is they're turning the microphone on for 10 seconds every 60 seconds, sampling the ambient uh, audio, and they can tell you what TV station you're listening to, what radio station you're listening to, what song from see, let's see on, beyond uh, uh, what they, you, they listen to consi consistently. Like they, they can gain all sorts of insight into who you are as a media consumer based on that audio. And I haven't touched that, but that's um, that's one way you can you can gain access to not only you know their media consumption, but also kind of their context and what they're currently doing. Very easy to, to hear t keyboard taps. It's quite easy to hear snoring. Um, so, when you look at last two questions, how to you know uh, even passively analyzing these networks, but how to control <coughs> so that you can. So intervention. Uh, so I mean that was what that was what serendipity was supposed to do. So we talked a lot about kind of how analyzing these graphs, but how do you create an edge? And that was, that was serendipity, it was you know, introducing two people who don't know each other but should know each other so you can establish that edge. Create that intervention and then see what happens next. Last question. So you talked about uh, the entropy, people with low entropy and uh, people with high entropy. Is it possible to use the data about individuals and partition your network? So that take out all the low entropy people and then make it as one network, wherein the prediction is very good, and then go to the other classes, uh -huh. so that you are dealing with only a part of the network every time, and reduce the complexity. You, you certainly, c I mean, it depends on what the inferences are. I mean, if you're looking at relationship inferences, that would help our classifier. If we could get rid of the random people, we would do better. Um, but that, that would be, I would, I would be hard to make that case to a reviewer, saying that I want to throw out these people that we don't do very well. Uh, at. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have, that's something that I, I haven't done other than throwing Marvin out. Um. Well, listen to uh, uh, Marvin, join me in thanking.